Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Late yesterday afternoon, during his day of Sabbath prayer and rest, a day when he and Deb and daughters Shira and Zoe should have been soaking in the peace and the joy of the Sabbath, a Sabbath which celebrated the music of Jewish faith, during which Rick and his synagogue and synagogues all over the world were also celebrating the memory of a Christian pastor, Martin Luther King Jr. I received a call from my friend and my colleague, Rabbi Rick Kellner. I was sitting with Susan at the kitchen table. I said to her, something is wrong. Rick never calls on the Sabbath. I answered the phone. I knew something was wrong right away. Rick's voice was clearly shaken. He asked if I had heard the news that another synagogue had been attacked. This time, a terrorist had taken four hostages at Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas, a suburb of Fort Worth. This time, one of his good friends, Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker, was a hostage. And he described Rabbi Charlie to me on the phone. He said, he is the nicest man in the world. When we were in seminary together, Charlie would go out onto the streets and sleep with homeless men and women to bring them comfort, to bring them food. He is so calm and so peaceful. There is no one I know who is more peaceful than he. If there's any hope, he continued, Charlie will be at the heart of bringing this to a peaceful end. And as the day went on, for those of us who were following the news, we know in fact that members of the synagogue would share stories about their rabbi, who's now been there 15 years. They would talk about him as an amazing, caring soul for his congregation, but also an interfaith witness there in, in Texas and we also heard Muslim leaders in the community gather together to talk about their prayers for Charlie, for the synagogue and the family, and tell stories of his work for peace. Now Rick went on to say that this terrorist attack and the murder of 11 at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in October 2018, and the murder of one and the injuring of three others in April of 2019 at a Chabad synagogue in Poway, California, had deeply affected his daughters and the other children of his synagogue, making them anxious about worshiping in their own synagogue and worried about their dad's safety as a rabbi. Now they were watching their dad react to the news that one of his friends was being held hostage on the other side of the country for one reason only. He was a Jew. As the sun set and the afternoon turned to evening, I reached out to every rabbi I know and offered prayers. I reached out to imams and Muslim friends and leaders. I reached out to my network of pastors and priests in the Pentecostal, Evangelical, Catholic, and Protestant communion across Columbus and across Ohio, throughout the nation, asking them as we could all be together to kneel down and pray. Prayers were lifted everywhere. Every rabbi was deeply grateful for the contact and the news that hundreds of churches and mosques and thousands of Christians and Muslims were praying for Charlie and the three hostages and for the terrorist hostage taker and their families and their synagogue all Jews everywhere and everyone involved in law enforcement on this campaign. Several religious leaders of Christian and Muslim background put out a press release late last night with the mayor and Shannon Harden to emphasize the need for prayer and unity 
throughout our region and our city. Last night, through a news feed via a tweet from Governor, uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, we all heard that the hostages were safe and free and the hostage taker was dead. I believe our prayers were answered. I believe that Charlie was central to saving himself and these members of his, three members of his congregation who were taken hostage. I believe that his heart is also broken, that the terrorist is dead. I believe that will become clear in the coming hours and days. Our prayers were all answered except one. The terrorist who committed this terrorist act is dead. In the words of the prophet Ezekiel 33:11, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. The God of Abraham is weeping. We are Abraham's descendants as he was the father of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. Abraham has no joy today at the death of the wicked, only sadness that yet another of God's beloved children did not turn from wickedness to live. Once again, children and their parents in communities of Jewish, Muslim, and Christian faiths are deeply affected having watched yet another hate-filled, rage-filled terrorist act on our soil, in our nation, in real time, played out in a house of prayer, in a community of faith during worship. This is jarring and scarring. What I prepared to preach about today was friendship. Friendship between two great prophets, Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel, a great Jewish scholar, and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a great Christian pastor. Two true geniuses of justice. I wanted to talk about the call to prophetic justice that has power and influence for each of our lives, and I just will share a few thoughts about these two magnificent men. On this Sunday, when the legacy and love of our nation's greatest nonviolent activist and greatest preacher and leader in American Christianity has come again, we find ourselves 54 years after his death still focused on raging violence and hate in our land, in our lives, in racial discrimination and separateness in caste and class in our own community as well as across the land. And it most definitely is right here in our community and in our state as a, an article said yesterday in the Columbus Dispatch, Ohio lags on almost every major measure of racial progress. Only eight states in our nation have made less racial progress in the last 50 years than Ohio. We are 37th for racially integrated education. We are 39th for infant mortality rate. We are 40th for the most integrated state. In other words, we're the 10th worst segregated state. We are the 45th state for biracial, social, and civic engagement. We are 45th for wealth and unemployment disparities. These are horrible statistics. They're shameful statistics. We should all be angered by these, injustice and these injustices and inequalities. These numbers should cause us to feel and respond like the maladjusted people that we are called to be. What do I mean, maladjusted people that we're called to be? Well, a true prophet, according to the true geniuses of justice, King and Heschel, should seek maladjustment as a prophetic goal. We should all feel maladjusted this morning. 
In an interview in 1972, Abraham Joshua Heschel spoke of his maladjustment. He said that all of us should always be surprised by statistics like these and news like yesterday's news. He said, I don't accommodate myself to the violence that goes on everywhere. I'm still surprised. And that is why I'm against it. That is why I can hope against it and work against it. We must learn how to be surprised, not to adjust ourselves. And then he said, I, Abraham Joshua Heschel, am the most maladjusted person in this society. With great pride, he said that. In 1957, in a speech given before the National Council of Churches, Dr. King spoke to his maladjustment. He wrote, or he said, I never intend to adjust myself to an economic system that will take necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and self-defeating effects of physical violence. And my friends, I call you to be maladjusted to all of these things that you see. It may be that the salvation of the world lies in the hands of the maladjusted. The challenge of this hour is to be maladjusted. Yes, the prophet Amos, who in the midst of tragic injustices of his day could cry out in words and echo across the generations, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And the world is in desperate need, he continues, to such maladjustment, and through such courageous maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. As maladjusted people, we should also reflect on what true friendship means. We see we need maladjusted friends in our work for justice. Some of my best friends are maladjusted. When I spoke with Dr. Susanna Heschel this summer about her father, Abraham Joshua Heschel, the only child of Dr. Heschel, spoke glowingly of the friendship that he held with Dr. King. In the spring of 2018 in Telos, Susanna Heschel wrote on her father and Dr. King in an essay entitled, A Friendship in the Prophetic Tradition, Abraham Joshua Heschel and Martin Luther King Jr. She wrote, the friendship between Heschel and King was unusual in its day and was surprising to many, but also inspiring because the two came from such different backgrounds and yet found intimacy that grew out of their religious commitments and transcended the growing public rift between their two communities. Heschel brought King and his message to a wide Jewish audience, and King made Heschel a central figure in the struggle for civil rights. See, Heschel and King were both prophets in their own rights. King was a prophet and preacher and organizer and pastor, and Heschel was a prophetic preacher and one of the most amazing biblical scholars ever. Both blended their prophetic gifts in powerful ways to address injustice. Together, I'd like to say they formed the dynamic duo of prophecy and truth-telling. In June 1963, when called to the White House to meet with President Kennedy and Dr. King, Heschel sent a telegram the day before to the president calling the president to declare a state of moral emergency. Seems like we should send that out tomorrow again. Continuing on, he said, the hour calls for moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. A few months later, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech, and Abraham Joshua Heschel was right there on his shoulder. When I asked Susanna about her father and Dr. King, she spoke with such love and affection for both men. She spoke of their deep relationship. She said, Dr. King was always sincere and gracious in our home. He was genuinely interested in what I was studying and reading and writing. He was always friendly and kind, always loved children, and showed his love for all the children that were in our orbit of friends, and welcomed, we welcomed him into our family as a member of our family. 
This morning, my maladjusted heart and mind are with my friend Rabbi Rick Kellner and his family. I'm struggling to imagine the world without him. Just as yesterday, he was struggling to imagine the world without Charlie, as he was looking at his friend in the midst of a hostage crisis. I pray that you find a place in your heart to reach out to someone today who is in this community of faith or beyond this community of faith, better yet, especially a friend or a relative who is Jewish. Have a meaningful conversation with them about how together we will build a better world. Reach out and touch someone with your heart today and know that it makes a difference. It really makes a difference. Amen.